Hello, everybody. This is Michael Haupt, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the next session in our Purpose Economy Telesummit. And today we're talking to Dr. Wayne Fisser. Before I introduce Wayne, I encourage you to keep the conversation going by adding your questions and opinions to our forum online. There's a link just below this video. So it's my great pleasure to, to introduce Dr. Wayne Fisser, who's the Transnet Chair of Sustainable Business at the Gordon Institute of Business Science. He's also the founder of CSR International and one of the pioneers of sustainability. Wayne, it's a huge honor to have you with us today. Thanks. It's a great pleasure to be with you. So, Wayne, I, I know that you widely traveled over 65 countries in the past 20 years. And in, in addition to your role at Gibbs in South Africa, you currently serve as senior associates at the University of Cambridge Program for Sustainability Leadership. And you're also the visiting professor of corporate responsibility at Deakin Business School in Australia. You've authored 19 books and published over 150 other works. And you're the recipient of more CSR awards than we can cover here. You've also been listed as one of the top 100 thought leaders in trustworthy business behavior in 2013. And here to lead the conversation with Wayne is the founder and CEO of Proudly for Purpose, Magna Rotenbach. Thank you, Michael. Michael is also my co-host for the Tele Summit, and he's the CEO and founder of The Brain Barn, which provides visibility, impact, and business services for thought leaders. And Wayne, thank you so much for being with us today to explore one of the topics at the core of sustainability, future fitness, making the purpose economy safe, smart, shared, sustainable, and satisfying. Uh, you're most welcome. It's great to be joining you uh, from afar, even though I'm South African, so uh, it's a small world today. You're so right, Wayne. You know, in recent years, some game-changing megatrends emerged shaping our world. Today, we will be exploring what future thinking tools we will need to be more resilient and successful in the 21st century. In short, we are going to ask questions. Are we fit for the future? Will our products, organizations, communities, cities, and countries survive and thrive in 10, 20, 50, or even 100 years? How can we as individuals, businesses, communities, and policymakers prepare for the future? So Wayne, what are those mega trends shaping our world? Yeah, well, I like to think of this as four stories of the future to illustrate that by 2050, the world will be very different to what we live in today. And that's a preface for thinking about how business or how governments or even how individuals might respond to these big trends. So the four stories each have a different flavor. The one is a human story. Uh, an economic story, an energy story, and an environmental story. And I want to just illustrate these by some of the projections or forecasts of what the world will be like in these different areas. If we start with a human story, uh, the projections at the moment on current progress are that we will reduce poverty, the number of people living in extreme poverty, from round about 1.2 billion in 2010, all the way down to 430 million by 2050. So this is a really positive story and suggests that we are making giant strides forward in eliminating poverty. In fact, the accelerated progress scenario of the United Nations, if everybody were to take the Millennium Development Goals seriously, is that we could get down to around about 100 million living in extreme poverty um, by 2050. So reducing it by a factor of 10 within one generation. So this is a really positive story. But there is a caveat. And that is that if an environmental disaster scenario emerges, as may be the case with climate change and some of the other challenges that we face, we could, in fact, undo all of the progress that we're making 
uh, on reducing poverty. So in South Asia, as an example, poverty, which is projected to reduce from just over 500 million all the way down to around about 100 million, could in fact go up to more than 1.2 billion again uh, if there's an environmental catastrophe scenario that emerges. A similar picture in sub-Saharan Africa, we could go down from around about 400 million in extreme poverty, which is projected to come down to something like 300 million. That could go up to more than a billion if there is an environmental catastrophe scenario. So there's a big wild card there that we need to keep our eye on. If we look at the economic story, here what we see is that most of the growth we expect in the world will be from the BRICS countries, so that's Brazil, Russia, India, Indonesia, China and South Africa, and uh, that's not a surprise for us, but what it also says is that you will probably have more than 150 countries in the world that are still developing countries, uh, still relatively poor, that have not grown much in the next 40 years. So we're seeing a few countries emerging very strongly and uh, I'm pleased to say South Africa is among those but we shouldn't forget about all of those other countries that are not emerging so strongly. And we have something in this story that uh, projects that we will probably see the Asian century emerge again. And I say again because in the 1700s, we perhaps forget, but Asia dominated the world's economy. Roughly 60% of the global GDP was from Asia. And we could expect that at least more than 50% of GDP in the world could come from Asia again by 2050. But here again, there's a caveat. There's something we call the middle income trap which is the difference between what happened in the Republic of Korea since the 1970s and what happened in Brazil and South Africa. Simply put, Korea took off in its economic growth and Brazil and South Africa stagnated. It remained more or less the same. And why was that? It was because in Brazil and South Africa we haven't managed to convert our economy from being very dependent on extractives and agriculture to one that is high manufacturing and services. And as a result, even though our incomes are going up, our competitiveness in the world is not going up. And if that were to be the case for the whole of Asia, um, then we would see a global GDP that is one third of what it might be if the Asian countries don't fall into this middle income trap. So we really need to watch that space as well. It could be a very different world. We've got an energy story which is really critical. We are completely dependent on fossil fuels. We know that. That's nobody's fault. But we also know that we have to wean ourselves of that. We have to get to 80 or 90 percent less carbon in the atmosphere by 2050. And um, this is not just an environmental story, this is actually an economic and an energy story. So there are some cities that are highly exposed. So by 2070, the assets of cities that will be exposed to sea level rise could be in the order of $2.5 trillion for, for, for cities like Miami, like uh, Mumbai, like Bangkok, and uh, many of those in, uh, in China. So we really need to uh, solve this problem. It's not only uh, an economic story, of course, it's also a human story. So by 2030, we expect that 350 million people will need immediate assistance as a result of weather-related disasters, and that by 2050, 200 million environmental refugees will exist, of which 150 million will be directly related to climate change. So what we're talking about is 1.5% of the world's population will be refugees as a result of energy-related impacts linked to climate change. 
So this is really a challenge that we have to take on much more strongly. Finally, the, the environmental story. Uh, this is one where we're really struggling to make significant progress. So by 2050, for example, there will still be uh, tens of millions of people living in water-stressed river basins. Uh, there will still be in the order of 10 million people dying from air pollution, both from particulates and uh, indoor pollution. So these are problems really that we, we haven't solved. If we look at biodiversity, it's, it's an even worse picture. Since 1970, according to the Living Planet Index, we've lost uh, roughly 30%, a third of the life on the planet. And uh, you don't have to be a mathematician to project that forward and to realize that our grandchildren will effectively have no life left on the planet if current trends continue. So the message of these four stories is that we will be living in an extremely uh, different, probably quite chaotic, certainly turbulent world uh, in the next 40 years. And the question for us today is, how do we respond to that? How do we adapt? How do we become more resilient? A grave picture indeed, Wayne. Um, fact is, our world is changing, and in parallel with that, business should be changing. So why don't you share with us uh, a bit more about what future fitness would be in this context? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm talking more and more about uh, future fitness rather than necessarily uh, CSR or CSI, social responsibility, social investment, or even sustainability, because we are all concerned about the future. And future fitness is really the idea that uh, we prepare so that as organizations, as cities, as countries, or even as individuals, we can fit into a future that is very different from today, like a piece of a puzzle. And if we don't change, if we don't adapt, we won't fit in and we won't survive. But I also mean fitness in another way, and that is that we have to be fit as in agile. Uh, we have to be able to adapt, to be flexible, what I sometimes call to be dexterous. And, uh, you know, this is the essence. If we can have a conversation about being fit for the future, it means that we don't put it into this little box called CSR or sustainability. This is something that concerns all of us. And I think it's a far more um, constructive way to have the conversation. And from your perspective, what would be the ideal picture? Um, or to capture it in a nutshell, uh, what are your five visions for a better world? Yeah, here I like to concentrate on things that we can agree on. And I've come up with a, a 5S framework just because it's, uh, it's easy to remember. And I think we have some consensus around these, uh, these visions for the future. So we all want a future that is safe, a future that protects and cares for us, uh, that uh, we have uh, communities and, uh, and families and organizations that are healthy, that we feel secure, that we are resilient, that we actually are surviving. So a safe future is one that I think we would all agree we want to strive for. We also want a shared future. And here we really have to look at the statistics again because um, at the moment, we don't really have a world that is very equal. Uh, at the moment, uh, roughly 20% uh, of the world's income is earning more than 80%. The world's population, 20%, is earning more than 80% of the income. And uh, the poorest 20% is earning just over 1% uh, of the income. And in fact, we're back where we were before the Great Depression uh, in the 1920s, where the top 1% was earning 70% of the income. And what we sometimes forget is that this is not an inevitable world. We can change this. In fact, after the two world wars and the Great Depression, we created a more equal world where the top 
uh, um, 1% was only earning 10% of the income. Uh, but then since the 1970s, we've again got more and more unequal. And this is not only for countries an issue, but also for companies. Uh, you know, if we look at the average worker pay between CEOs um, and, and employees, uh, we find that in the United States in 1970, it was 40 to 1. Uh, today, it's more than 250 to 1. So these gaps are getting larger. And that's not the future we want. We want a shared future, one that includes us, values us, that's fair, also that's diverse. And we're talking about a diversity of people here and that is really inclusive, that benefits everybody. So that's the second vision, really. The third is that we want a smart future. This is a future that connects and empowers us. So we're talking about not only a future where people are educated, have opportunities for learning, but also a future that's smart in the modern sense of being connected, as in smartphones. Uh, so we want people to have access to the internet. And there's a very interesting index that we can look at here to track our progress. It's called the Web Index, and it was created by the founder of the World Wide Web, the inventor of uh, the internet. And there, if you go online, you can have a look at how countries are performing uh, in using the internet for social good. So are they using it to promote media freedom, human rights, eliminating poverty, and so on? So we really need to track those indicators to see that we are becoming smarter as a, as a society. And then the fourth vision is, is that we do want a future clearly that's sustainable, where we're protected, where the environment is restored, uh, made more diverse, it's renewable, it's enduring, it's evolutionary. And here we really have to take stock of the current trends. If we look at something like the limits to growth uh, modeling, which in 1972 was the first computer model that looked at uh, projecting the path of our civilization going through to 2100, it projected an overshoot and collapse because what we see is that we have limited resources, we're consuming them at a completely unsustainable rate. That's both a factor of the growing population and of the uh, increased consumption that comes with improving our quality of life. And that study has been updated four times. Uh, it's been updated uh, 20 years later, 30 years later, and most recently it, uh, it's in the form of the projection to 2052 by Jorgen Randers. And he's got a book on that. And unfortunately it's projecting still a similar picture. So we really need to look at the sustainability issue not as something nice to have, nice to do, but this is the resources and the life support systems on which we are dependent and which we are currently eroding at a, at a rapid and a completely unsustainable rate. The last uh, vision of the future is one we often forget about and that's to have a satisfying future, one that fulfills and inspires us. So here we're talking about well-being, about uh, products that have high quality that really add something to our lives, but also about uh, a lifestyle and uh, an environment that um, makes us feel satisfied, that brings meaning to our life in our workplace. In fact, to put it quite simply, we want a future where we can be happy. And here again, if you look at some of the data, the Happy Planet Index is one uh, created by the New Economics Foundation, we see some surprises. So a country like the United States not performing terribly well a country like Costa Rica, in fact, topping the tables on the Happy Planet Index. The reason being that this measures the efficiency with which we convert resources, our environmental resources, into satisfaction in our lives. And of course, uh, United States, although they have a, a high quality of life, um, it's very inefficient in their use of resources. Whereas a country like Costa Rica, is one of the few that's increasing diversity every year and also one where um, the quality of life is really prioritized. In the United States, 
what we see is that in one generation they've doubled their economy, so children today are twice as wealthy as their parents, but it's brought them no extra happiness, roughly a third of Americans, if you ask them, uh, as the surveys do over the decades, how happy are you in your life, uh, roughly a third say they're happy, and that hasn't changed despite the economic growth. So this is all about questioning our measures of progress, our measures of well-being. And if we take these together, I think we can create a vision and we can start to find key performance indicators which will guide us towards that better future. And I haven't just invented these from, from nothing. Uh, three of them, in fact, are at the core of the European Union's Lisbon 2020 competitiveness strategy. Uh, that is to create a what they call a smart, sustainable, and inclusive economy for the European Union. To that, of course, I've added safe and satisfying. So let's work with these visions and see what it would take to actually create them. And thank you so much for sharing your Far Future Fitness Framework. But I know that you also um, have five strategies for resilience in a turbulent future. What would those be? Yeah, well, there's two ways to look at the future. One is that we have the ability to shape the future. So the, f the five visions that I've just talked through are all about uh, uh, trying to influence the future to something which we desire. And of course we have some ability to do that. But the reality is that the future also happens to us. And in fact, we expect that the, the future will be more dynamic, more turbulent, perhaps even more chaotic. And so we also have to think about how do you survive and thrive in very difficult contexts. And this is where resilience becomes important. And so for companies, for communities, for cities, for countries, uh, if they follow uh, strategies for resilience, they will be more prepared. And I suggest just five to get us started. You need to be thinking about whether you can defend your assets and your values. At one level, you could think of this quite simply. This is just about uh, 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 tools like insurance, where when things go wrong, you actually have a way to recuperate, recover uh, assets that have been damaged. Um, but it also can mean sometimes physical defense. So I happen to be co-producing a, a TV documentary at the moment called Sinking Nation. And this is about uh, the island of Kiribati in the Pacific. And it's probably going to be the first nation that will have to be evacuated as a result of rising sea level. And their defense at the moment are these very low walls created from sandbags that are actually quite ineffective to defend themselves against this uh, rising tide of climate change. So we need to think about uh, a physical defense, but then also about defending your values. Um, this is something that will give you strength in times of difficulty. The second strategy is to diversify. Of course, we all know the basic idea that you don't want to put your eggs in one basket. And in this case, we mean diversify both your people and your products so that uh, if a particular product line has a hard time or gets wiped out by a catastrophe, at least you have other investments, you have other uh, products and services that you can rely on. But of course it's also about the people because what we know is that when things get difficult, uh, what we need is ideas to respond and to solve challenges. And if we have all people who are the same, we get a groupthink mentality and you're actually less able to be creative and to be innovative uh, unless you have the diversity. So diversify people and products. The third resilience strategy is to decentralize. Quite simply, to take uh, an example, the reason that the internet is so resilient is because it's decentralized. If one server goes down, uh, it doesn't affect the whole world because 
the internet is stored on servers all around the world. And we need to apply this principle to our investments and to where we're getting our returns, uh, where we're getting our stream of benefits. Uh, clearly, if uh, you're invested in a particular community and you're only in that community, uh, then if something goes wrong in that community, there's a catastrophe, uh, your whole business and your whole livelihood could be wiped out. So we need to decentralize. We need to think about uh, things like decentralized energy. So why do we always want to create centralized power plants? That makes us very vulnerable. Whereas if everybody had their own wind turbine and their own solar panel, the chances that when things go wrong, uh, you will be in a, in a bad situation are much less. So we need to think about that. The fourth strategy is to decouple. And here we mean decouple our resources from our impact. Because we know that the only way that we will be allowed to grow in future, the only possible way, is if growth does not come at the expense of the environment. Quite simply, there are limited resources and our growth is completely unsustainable. So this is an example such as a, a company like Unilever, uh, Paul Pullman saying, you won't have permission to grow in future unless you can decouple your resources and your impacts. As a result, their core strategy is to double in size while halving their environmental impact. So net zero impact from growth. Um, the third, uh, sorry, the fifth uh, resilience strategy then is to define, and by this we mean define your purpose and your performance. Because what we know is that people that have something to believe in are far more likely to survive when the going gets tough. And here we can refer back to the work of the Austrian psychiatrist Viktor Frankl, who actually lived and survived through not through four Nazi concentration camps. And when he tried to understand how that is possible, that some people were able to survive even these terrible conditions, he found it was those people that had something to believe in, that had a purpose beyond themselves, something they still felt that they could impact on the world, make a contribution, give something back. And we need to think about how this applies to countries, to companies, to cities. It's not inspiring for people to have a purpose of increasing sales by a few percentage points. We have to connect to people's human purpose. And as human beings, we want to make a positive difference in the world, in our own lives, but of course also in the lives of others. So we need to think about uh, redefining the purpose. If we take these five strategies together, defend, diversify, decentralize, decouple, and define, then what we end up with is an ability to be dexterous. So dexterity is the result of uh, these five strategies. And of course, by that, we mean the ability to adapt and evolve. And I'll give you just a metaphor for this to remember. If we look at the aspen trees in Colorado, they grow in forests on the mountain. And they're very unusual because uh, they're subjected to lots of rock av avalanches. And what happens is an avalanche comes down the mountainside and completely flattens these forests. And then strangely, after the avalanche has passed, all the, the trees just stand straight back up again. Why? Because they're connected through the root system underground and they're very flexible. And so this is a metaphor for what we're striving to achieve when we talk about resilience. When you're looking at best practice examples, there's been a lot of controversy uh, uh, about the legacy of companies and how they can shed their wrongdoing of the past. What is your take on that? And who are the real diamonds and uh, true examples of future fit leaders? Yeah, here I I do think we have to be a bit careful that we don't uh, demonize either individuals or, or companies. I think uh, there are companies that have high impacts on, on the environment and on people. And what we need to look at is what are the incentives that are making 
to then behave in that way. Uh, we have to look at the rules of the game. And at the moment, the way we've structured our economy is that it's actually quite difficult to be responsible and sustainable uh, and to be rewarded by the market. Because the market, especially the financial market, is rewarding very short-term performance. And so we're trapped in the system and we have to change it. Having said that, there are, of course, some pioneers who, who really go ahead of the curve and we demonstrate that we can do things differently. And let's take a few examples. Um, I often work with uh, some principles here, so how creative, how innovative are companies as well. Uh, they don't always have to be big companies. We could look at a, an example like uh, Anurag Gupta. He runs a company called A Little World. It's a micro-banking company in India. What do we mean by a micro-bank? Well, uh, they set up branches in the poor villages of India, and a branch is one woman who sits at her kitchen table. All she has is a mobile phone and a biometric scanner. Uh, one of her uh, fellow villagers comes in to her kitchen, and uh, they don't need to be able to read or write. They don't need any documentation, any proof of identity or, or address. All they do is they speak into the mobile phone, and that takes their voice identity, and they take their fingerprints that's connected to the mobile phone, and two days later they have a basic bank account. Suddenly you're including a whole lot of uh, people in the economy that were excluded before. And the phone effectively becomes the branch. It holds 50,000 records for five years. And in fact, that micro branch takes only $80 a month to run. So this is an example of somebody who's using creativity um, to solve a social problem. And that's key, especially in this world of codes and standards. We have to move beyond that to innovation. We take another example. Uh, many of the solutions we see are not going to scale. When you get a company then like Walmart, biggest retailer in the world, one of the biggest companies in the world, saying that they will no longer sell any seafood products that are not certified as Marine Stewardship Council sustainable, you start to get scale in the solutions so that it's not just a niche ethical product that some people who can afford it buy. And we really need to look at this strategy, which we call choice editing. Uh, there are other retailers taking similar approaches. Sainsbury's here in the UK. You can't buy bananas that are not fair trade. So they just take the choice away from the consumer and say, the new standard of quality is sustainable and is fair trade. And we need far more of that. And of course, governments also have to get involved in, in scaling up. Uh, if we take incandescent light bulbs as an example, it was only really when the EU government stepped in and banned incandescent light bulbs that we saw a scalable conversion to compact fluorescence. Um, we can look at other examples. So are we being genuinely responsive to the, the needs of our, our stakeholders? Uh, well, take an example like... Um, um, we could say Timberland, or we could say Patagonia. What's Patagonia doing differently? Well, they decided that uh, uh, the biggest impact of their industry, which is making outdoor garments, similar to Cape Union Mark, was in the cotton, which was very uh, dirty, in fact. A lot of chemicals, a lot of water, a lot of energy. Converting 100% to organic cotton. So genuinely responding to our need for a less toxic environment, not at a small scale, but at a big scale. In fact, they transformed the whole US market for organic cotton because it didn't exist before that. Um, if we take another example of uh, SC Johnston coming to, uh, to Kenya to offer products at the so-called base of the economic pyramid, so selling to poor people and discovering that actually their products didn't work uh, in the communities of Kenya because they had cleaning products and the problem for the community was the, uh, the communal toilets 
And when they tested SC Johnson's products, they came back and said, actually, your products don't work. Why? Because we have mud floors and walls. So the ability, as SC Johnson did, to adapt, to redesign their products so that it actually works not only uh, at a global level, but also at a local level. And the final example, perhaps, circularity is, is a theme now that every company needs to be adopting, the circular economy, which means going for zero waste. And here we have many examples. Uh, Interface, the carpet company, has got something they call Mission Zero, which is by 2020, they will have zero net impact on the environment. So we're talking about zero, uh, um, zero waste, uh, zero carbon, uh, zero water uh, impact. And that's really ambitious, but they're on track to get there. And we sometimes think this is a dream, the idea of zero waste. No, it's a design challenge. Uh, uh, Fuji Xerox in, in Asia now uh, is reaching 98.5% recyclability of their products. So we can do this if we set our mind to it. So Wayne, it's almost the case of snapping out of the status quo and it's visible with all of these pioneers that they managed to do that. And uh, you would agree with me that then strategy alone would not suffice and that uh, we need to go look at practical steps uh, to become future fit. Yes, I think that's always a good, a good question. If I were to go back to the office tomorrow, where would I start? And I think uh, uh, one place to start is that you need to reassess where you are. So the first step is always about impact. Are you genuinely measuring your impact? Um, are you uh, uh, fooling yourself because you're using it as public relations by just producing a report that looks nice and glossy? I'll give you another story here. The uh, CEO of Patagonia commissioned a report that complies with the Global Reporting Initiative, the GRI, uh, to uh, disclose some information about their impacts uh, on society and the environment. When he saw a draft of that report, he was sitting in his boardroom with his, his uh, top management, and he said in his language, this is bullshit. He said, this is not a true picture of our real impacts. And so what they did differently, they never published that report, but they created the Footprint Chronicles. And what this really is, is looking at the life cycle impacts of their products, all the way from extracting, growing all the way through to disposal uh, of the waste. And once you take that level of analysis, you start to get a true understanding of what your footprint is. And I think more and more companies and cities and communities have to work out their true footprint uh, in an honest way. So that's the start. You reassess, which is about impact. The second step then is you need to realign. And here, of course, we're talking about partnerships. Who are you working with? What's become absolutely clear in the last few decades is that these problems we face are difficult, and they're big, they're global, and we can't solve them on our own. Business can't solve them, government can't solve them, and neither can civil society. It's only by working together that we're really making progress. And that might mean working cross-sector, between government and business, between NGOs and business, or it can actually mean by collaborating with those within your industry or those in other industries. And you know, it's, it's when we work together that we start to see the impacts really uh, uh, showing. So the question here is, who are you in partnership with? Are you only talking to those that agree with you, or do you have also some challenging NGOs sitting on your advisory board. The third step then I always recommend is to redefine. So what are you about as a community, as a company, as a city? What is the real leadership agenda? Uh, because what's become clear is that people want and need to be inspired. What we see is that the problems are large and urgent and that we're not keeping up 
in terms of our responses. So the only way we can really solve those problems is by being ambitious. And ambition means that you really need to, uh, you need to push people. So Ray Anderson, the founder of Interface, said when he announced his Mission Zero in 1994, people said, you're round the bend. You know, you must be mad. And he said, absolutely. The job of me as a leader is to see round the bend where other people can't see. We have to set goals that take people's breath away because they don't know how they're going to get there, but they're very inspired by the idea that maybe they could get close to that ambitious goal. And so if we think of Walmart again, under Lee Scott, when they belatedly woke up to the idea of sustainability, which was after Hurricane Katrina, instead of just saying we're going to have a few targets on waste and a few targets on energy, he said, no, we will go for zero waste, we will go for 100% renewable energy, and we will strive to make every single one of our products certified as sustainable. Um, or to take Unilever as an example again, not only double in size and halve our environmental impact, but help a billion people out of poverty through our products and services. These are goals that we can get inspired and excited about. And so you have to check the innovation and the ambition of your leadership. The fourth step then is to redesign. We won't solve these problems unless we innovate. So we're talking about creating products and services that are inherently better for the world that make our lives better, that make the environment function better. And here we see massive opportunities. You know, China is investing today double what the United States invests in clean energy. Not because they are philanthropic, because they see the opportunity in innovating in these sunrise industries. South Korea is investing in the same way that they invested in microelectronics in the 80s and 90s, Today, they're investing in clean technologies. So redesign and innovation is the fourth step. And then the last one, and the most difficult, really, is to restructure. And what I mean by that is change the rules of the game. Look at your policy impacts. And instead of just lobbying negatively, as companies often do, trying to resist more legislation, really work with government to try and find uh, solutions policy incentives, that will make it better for you as a company, but also for the society. And here, to give you an example, we have something called the Corporate Leaders Group on Climate Change, which we uh, host uh, on behalf of the Prince of Wales here in Cambridge. And here, what, what we were really doing was, we were listening to governments and, and hearing them say, we can't do bold policy on climate change because companies will lobby against us. And we were listening to business who were saying, we can't do bold investments in clean technologies because we don't have the policy stability uh, to, to work with. And so we acted as a kind of intermediary, and we asked each of the parties what the public messages were that they would need to be hearing from the other side which would enable them to be ambitious. And as a result, you know, the UK now has probably the strongest uh, climate legislation in the world. So we have to be looking at ways to restructure the market, to change those incentives, to make it the easiest and the most profitable thing in the world to be responsible and sustainable. So those are the five steps I suggest. Reassess your impacts, realign with your partnerships, redefine your leadership, redesign your, your, your products through innovation, and restructure the market through policy. Wayne, well, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom on future fitness and what that um, might entail. And um, we are looking forward to getting closer engaged on the Crowdly for Purpose um, platform to make uh, purpose-driven leadership uh, a reality on the broader base. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I mean, the, the, the message I always like to leave with is to just say to people, the future is not something that is optional. Yeah, this is 
this is not something that nice people will do because they're charitable. We are going to see a transformation in the world, and the question is just which side of history do you want to be on? Do you want to be the one that actually made things better or the one that was part of the problem? So thanks so much for the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you very much, Wayne, and thank you, Magna, for hosting us, and thank you uh, for our viewers for uh, spending this time with us. Certainly some interesting thoughts for us to go out and uh, uh, do some inspiring things.